This is Colin Cattell with Palisade Radio. On the line with us today is a new guest to the program, Gregor Gregerson, owner of Silver Bullion Singapore and the Safe House Depository. Gregor, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We met about a year ago, and I've been trying to get you on the program ever since, but you've been selling so much silver, you've not had a moment in the day. The story about how you got into the bullion business is fascinating. It all started with you meeting people in train stations and exchanging bags of cash for silver. Do you mind sharing that story with our listeners? Yes. Well, it, it, it all started with me having lived a long time in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, Italy, Germany. I finally decided to move to Singapore just because it was a very uh, safe, well-run state with low taxes. And, you know, it was, it was a great place to have a business eventually. And um, I figured, figured it'd make sense to buy some bullion, especially silver. But at the time, there was no way of getting it in Singapore. Um, it was possible to get some gold, but no silver. As the closest I got was some uh, Indian coins, 92.5. Uh, pure with a goddess Shiva on it, but there was no maple leaves, there was no American eagles, no bars, and so on. So uh, I started very small. I thought I would get some silver. I thought if I cannot sell anything, that's quite okay because I saw it as an investment for myself. And I built a website, and I saw what was going to happen. And uh, I started to get some demand, and I would actually. Uh, have people lock in prices online and I would meet them at, uh, at a train station. So I would sell some, I bring some 40 coins of eagles or something like this and they would be paying me in Singapore dollars for it. And uh, it, it sounds quite adventurous, but it was actually the safest way of getting bullion at the time because there was no way of getting it in Singapore. And what people used to do back then is they would call up some person from classified ads and give them $20,000 and uh, come back four weeks later, hopefully the guy would have a box of eagles for him. So uh, that was how it started. It was just one guy having his silver, you know, under his bed, meeting people, people at the MRT station. And then when, when I saw that people would meet me at the MRT station to buy this stuff, I uh, understood the case is a market. Maybe it's worthwhile investing more money into, into this. And that was five years ago. You have a background in computer programming, and that has allowed your bullion business to evolve into a totally secure environment with daily auditing. Start with just the silver bullion side of the business and describe how Silver Bullion SG operates for customers. Well, what what I wanted to do is really run Silver Bullion the way uh, I, I thought it ought to be running, as a, really more of a wealth protection sort of setup. And as you mentioned, my background is, I have a dual background in finance and software development, especially databases. Uh, so while I was doing this, uh, started Silver Bullion, I was still working as a senior data architect uh, for uh, you know, a very large bank. Um, I used to give seminars for Microsoft on you know, data development, data structures, and those sort of things, trading systems. So it, it was quite... Uh, straightforward for me to build the website, allow people to log in rates, uh, create five inventory systems, control systems, and so on. I'm very much a process person. And so that was something which allowed Silver Bullion to really grow early on because, from my understanding, we were the first site in Southeast Asia that would allow somebody to log in prices for physical uh, online and then actually get delivery within it within a day or something like this. And since then, we've, we've kept on doing things quite differently from other businesses in that my goal has been doing as, uh, having as much transparency as possible, uh, owning bullion outright in the company, so we're actually an asset rich company, and not having any debt. So uh, whatever money we earned, I just kept it into business. I reinvested it and by now, we have 120,000 ounces of silver. We have about 850 ounces of gold that we own outright. So we can have large customers now come to us and you know walk out with 40,000 ounces of silver if needed. So that's been, uh, that's been one of the cornerstones of what we've done and was part of our initial success. Just a couple months ago, you launched Safe House. 
for our listeners, imagine a mini-sized Costco, but rather than food and goods stacked on the shelves, you have pallets and pallets of silver bars. The entire facility is fully insured and securitized. Walk us through the safeguards you've implemented and why so many people are storing their bullion with you. Well, uh, what what I've wanted to do is look at wealth protection from a holistic approach. So it, it's not just about you know securing a place from somebody trying to steal some bullion, but it's making sure that from a legal standpoint you are safe. So the reason why we felt we had to build our own storage facility was that at the time, um, the main facility was storing bullion in Singapore, it's a Singapore Freeport, but the companies which operates it are predominantly large international companies, which uh, if you read the contracts, you would normally find two problems. Um, one of it is they will have a force majeure clause which would state that any governmental action by any government anywhere in the world uh, would indemnify the storage provider uh, for any action. And the way I understand this is that if the U.S., for example, were to nationalize gold, then if the storage provider, which would have a lot of exposure to the U.S., were to ship the gold back to the U.S., there's nothing that a client can do. So that's something I did not like. And the other problem was there was something called mysterious disappearance. Now, if you ever read a storage contract carefully, and in most cases, if you buy bullion from an intermediary, you'll never get to see this because that is way down the counterparty chain. Uh, then you will find that oftentimes mysterious disappearance is not covered. And so in other words, if the insurance company cannot determine why something disappeared, and they will not pay. And that is something, once you make people aware of this, they get quite scared because it, it, it really does sound scary. So as we built the, one of the main reasons for building the safe house was to address these two problems. And uh, the first problem we solved or we, we addressed by both silver bullion and safe house, basically just having Singapore uh, just being under Singapore jurisdiction. In other words, we have no exposure to the U.S. in any way, uh, other than the fact that we still accept U.S. dollars for payment. Uh, the same with Europe. So if, for example, we have an IRS officer or somebody calling us, uh, you know, for us it's the same deal as having a, a tax officer from Zimbabwe calling us. It, it is a foreign jurisdiction, which... It doesn't really have jurisdiction over Singapore. So we will just refer them back to Singapore authorities. And if they could get a warrant or something like this through Singapore, then, you know, fine. But but otherwise, you know, we we, we are quite isolated um, by design from Western influence because uh, I think what you want to do when you're still bullion is you want to be worried about a repeat of what happened in 1933 when gold was nationalized in the U.S., and that's why uh, storing bullion in Singapore, which is a very good jurisdiction, uh, when you do so, you want to make sure that there isn't a clause which will just say, oh, we can send it back, you know, if, if somebody demands to do it. Uh, the second point when it comes to mysterious disappearance is I, we pretty much put one and a half years worth of programming work into the software systems that run the safe house. Now, the safe house is a facility that can store about 600 tons of, gold, of silver, which, you know, from, from what I've been reading from the Silver Institute, is about uh, a bit more than 1% of the known above-ground silver reserves right now. So it is quite, really quite quite substantial. And 30 tons of gold in a Class two vault. So uh, at current values, we're probably talking over a billion dollars that this facility can store. And... It's about 7% full. It's storing about 43 tons of silver, about 900 kg of gold right now. And the key thing here is that we managed to insure it with a very powerful insurance. Uh, it's coming through Excel Group, which is a uh, Lloyd underwriter. Uh, we had inspectors at the facility several times in order to, to get this, uh, this insurance. But what's so special about it is 
that it doesn't just insure for theft and fire, which is a standard, but it also covers infidelity and mysterious disappearance. Now, infidelity basically means that if we have an inside job or if we actually go out and we steal the bullion and we run away with it, the insurance company will pay for it. And mysterious disappearance means that if for whatever reason something disappears, and and I say mysterious disappearance, it can be as uh, you know mysterious as us getting a shipment of a hundred bars of gold, us miscounting it, uh, and say there are only ninety nine bars, and and somehow we think there are hundred, and we store it thinking there are hundred, but it's always been ninety nine, uh, and if that's the case, the insurance company will actually pay for it. So in in essence, the insurance company is trusting us with a current amount of 100 million US dollars, said we we don't make mistakes, like that, and that we don't, uh, of course, run away with it. So it's a lot of trust that, that we're getting, and the reason we're getting that is because uh, we we didn't take any corners. We, we have a very strong system. Everything is triple-checked. We have our own police officers at the facility. We have a, a, a ticketing system, which you know, ensure the process wise nothing, you know, it can disappear or it's very, very, very uh, unlikely. And our insurance coverage is basically our great uh, uh, our great that we got for building setting all of this up. And I see this insurance and this safe house as a stepping block for creating additional services, additional things for our customers, which are all based on the solid foundation. Singapore is arguably the best place to store bullion on earth, and you already touched on this a bit. I believe there's more silver and gold in Singapore than Switzerland, or it's approaching that point now. Why should investors choose such a small country to store their bullion? Uh, For example, is there enough of a military presence in Singapore to prevent from invasion from an outside country? Well, the the good thing about Singapore is, uh, it's a very good book if you want to understand Singapore. It's called From Third World to First World from Lee Kuan Yew, which was the prime minister from Singapore from 65 to 89. He's pretty much the, um, the father of, of Singapore. Uh, but to make a, uh, to summarize it quickly, uh, Singapore is, is, is a bit like, Singa- like Switzerland in many ways, in that it was very smart to always, to never ally itself strong with any one side and to never really anger any one side. It's always a neutral entity. So politically, it's it's uh, quite safe in that the, it, it forms a useful function for many different countries, and it's very politically and uh, racially and so on diverse. So it's, there's not much reason to attack Singapore from that point of view. But when it comes to defense, Singapore, uh, oddly enough, is actually one of the biggest military forces in Southeast Asia, and. The reason is that Lee Kuan Yew, he, he followed a policy called the poison shrimp policy. And the idea was back in the Cold War, you know, there were the sharks, which is the U.S. and the USSR, which are the really big guys, and they would eat the, the fish, which might be, you know, smaller nations like Malaysia, potentially Indonesia, and so on. And then the idea is that the fish can eat the shrimp. The shrimp are the, you know, really small places like Singapore. And the reason it's called the poison shrimp policy is because Singapore basically has built so many military assets that if they were to be invaded, uh, even if the invasion were done by such a surprise, that they have enough military assets that they can pretty much create so much damage on the, on the attacking country by placing uh, you know, lots of, of planes and so on in outside military bases. I mean, Singapore has military bases in Texas, they have it in Taiwan, they have it in Thailand, in India, in Australia, a uh, few other places which I forgot right now. And these are all long-range uh, bombers and so on uh, that they can use to, to basically have military theft assets outside, outside of Singapore. When it comes to manpower, now, uh, Singapore has a two-year trust, and citizens are and PRs are required to go to yearly exercises, which are about a week long, uh, until they're a year of until they're forty years old. 
And what that means is that Singapore can actually muster 950,000 soldiers at short notice. And if you look at a country like Malaysia, which is a big neighbor of Singapore, they have a quote-unquote professional army, but it's only 50,000. So little tiny Singapore actually has uh, what is it, about 19 times more manpower and arguably much better equipment than what Malaysia does. I mean, they have, uh, I think, 60, 70 F-15s, for example. They have uh, longbow attach, uh, Apache attack helicopters. There's the German Leopard 2 tanks. They have the latest drones. Um, so they, it's a very, very rich country. It's a very well-managed country. And it's a very well-defended country. So uh, they're very astute politically and they're very astute um, uh, militarily. But what makes Singapore a good choice, I believe, is that, as Lee Kuan Yew, you know, summarized it, what makes Singapore successful is confidence. Uh, it's that people know that there is very little or no corruption, that the laws are set, that it's they're not going to be uh, implemented in different ways for different people. And that's, that's what made Singapore rich, because people trust it. Singapore itself has no natural resources. So if Singapore would ever lose the trust of investors and of, of other people, then they would have very little to fall back to. So Singapore cannot afford to, you know, take, say, all the gold and ship it out and because they, they, they lose risking their trust. And if they lose their trust, then, you know, the whole country might, might suffer, you know, a damage where it might not recover from. And that is very well understood in Singapore. And so the combination of trust being so important and Bullion and you know stories of bullion all being based on trust uh, arguably makes Singapore the best place in the world to to store the bullion. A because it is safe. B because the country would have so much to lose if they were to to give in to some demands. Gregor, on that note, thank you for sharing a few minutes of your time. Investors interested in purchasing bullion through Gregor can visit silverbullion.com.sg. And the new site is thesafehouse.sg. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you.